In this exclusive footage obtained by Channel 4 News is the police stop of the vehicle that Daniel Cliff hid underneath. Cliff used makeshift strapping below the vehicle where there appears places he could hold. Eyewitnesses say the driver looked confused and surprised about how a routine delivery became part of the getaway for an alleged double agent. A lorry that was supposed to transport food has delivered a stowaway to freedom. But for how long as the search may be closing in? This is the route the vehicle took from Wandsworth Prison before it was stopped on Upper Richmond Road. Now in between both is where there is a confirmed sighting of Khalif. Thanks to the support uh, of the media appeal uh, that puts Daniel at Wandsworth Roundabout, uh, that's Trinity Road Junction with Swandham Way in Wandsworth, just after his escape and coming out from underneath the lorry uh, and then walking down Swandham Way towards the town centre. This is what Khalif may have been wearing. He was last seen in a chef's uniform like this before he escaped on this lorry. This is new video of the vehicle making its way down Wandsworth Road just before the police intervened on Wednesday morning. The vehicle was stopped here over an hour from when it left Wandsworth Prison. The alarm was raised that Daniel Cliff was missing at 7.50. But by the time the vehicle got here, 8.36, 8.37, Daniel Cliff had already jumped off. I saw in the morning three police cars, they approached one big truck. Then suddenly, I don't know what happened, I just come down. Then I saw a lot of police is in here. The driver was shot, looked really shocked himself, so I, I, I can't say if it was intentional or not. But yeah, it was, it's quite surprising someone to be able to get, get away like that. You only see the movies, but yeah, it's something interesting happening on a, on a you know, Wednesday morning in Putney. This is the face the police are searching for. 21-year-old Daniel Khalifa was awaiting trial for terror offences and is accused of breaching the Official Secrets Act. The investigation to find him has also involved a search of Richmond Park that was closed last night, an area that had links to Khalif. But so far, Khalif remains at large. Some people will assume that due to the length of time he's been missing that he's never going to be found. But that is simply not the case in terms of the methods and, and people we have working on this case. I believe it's a matter of when, not if we find him. There is now a £20,000 reward for information that leads to arrest. The only sighting yet is from the day he escaped. And this is his third day free. Simeon Brown reporting there. Well, I'm now joined by Nick Aldworth, the UK's former counter-terrorism coordinator. Nick Aldworth, a confirmed sighting on Wednesday. How significant is this? It's really significant because it gives the police another point from which to start their investigation. You know, without uh, somewhere where they can start tracking this individual through the multitude of CCTV that exists across London, uh, you, you know, they'll be responding to calls from Dublin to Portugal and everywhere in between. So it's a really important finite place from which they can now start to track him. And, and they will track him. Uh, that, that's the nature of our surveillance society. I mean, it's almost 60 hours since that sighting. Uh, so far, we, we don't know of any other sighting. How do you make that information really count? So what they'll be doing is um, sweeping uh, the area that he's seen in or seen moving towards for CCTV. And then and things like door cams and vehicle cams, dashboard cams. And they literally weave that together, quite often using artificial intelligence. And they will track this individual. And at the point at which they lose him, they will then do another sweep. And what you do slowly, and this is why it takes a bit of time, is you literally track this person footstep by footstep to wherever they're going. And then concurrently, they'll be looking into his associates, his family, the places that they know that he frequents or has frequented. Um, as somebody who's been charged and is inside the system, we know a lot about this individual, particularly as a former soldier. Um, we'll have a lot of his antecedents uh, known to us. I mean, there are many questions about the fact that he is ex-army. People asking whether his army training might have helped him execute this. A lot of questions about whether he's working alone whether he's being shielded. What's your best assessment at the moment, given what we know? Well, I, I think that um, there's clearly a lot to be looked at, including, you know, how are people monitored inside the prisons? You know, you've got to keep a pretty deadpan face to uh, actually be planning an escape 
have presumably equipment with you to execute that escape and then, you know, step out the door and step under a lorry. So I think those sorts of things need to be looked at. Did anybody help him do that? And, and that isn't intended to cast aspersions on the prison service. That is a natural course of investigation. Um, and as I say, we'll be looking at uh, his associates and it won't just be from the point that he's gone missing. We'll now be looking at his associates for days, if not weeks beforehand to see whether they've conducted any unusual activity. I mean, the police have announced this reward now. It really does put the focus on the public. They're critical, aren't they? that the public are always critical in policing matters. Uh, the, the Peelian principle of you know, uh, the public are the police and the police are the public is, is never truer in these things. The police don't operate without the consent of the public and without the assistance of the public. There are you know, 64 million pairs of eyes and ears in the UK and 140,000 uh, eyes and ears of the police service. So absolutely critical and uh, you know, the in inducement of a, a £20,000 reward might make people look a bit harder, but it also might make people with that piece of information uh, come forward. It's unusual for somebody to be able to survive alone um, in, in anywhere, uh, let alone a big city. He will make contact with somebody and that sort of reward is intended to encourage those sorts of people to come forward. And I mean, the longer that he's been missing, the longer he's on the run, does that increase the idea or, or the likelihood of the idea that he has had help somewhere? Look, soldiers are resilient, innovative, uh, tough, uh, bold people, and you know, the nature of this escape uh, indicates how audacious this individual is. So I think he will be resilient to survive on his own for quite some time. Uh, you know, we are enjoying a fabulous spell of warm weather. I think in the middle of winter, things might be a little bit different. But I think it could be some days before he needs to become dependent on other people. Uh, what we've seen in the past with other um, escapees is that they yeah. eventually get hungry and then perhaps because they have no money have to steal and that is the point at which they show their hand. Nick Oldworth, going to have to end it there, but thanks very much for talking to us. Thank you. So what does the escape say about the state of England's prisons amid a huge row over funding cuts, overcrowding and staff shortages? The priority right now for the prison service is to get Daniel Khalif back behind bars. But how did he escape? an act of audacious brilliance, or simply a sign of a crumbling prison system, unable even to keep prisoners locked inside. Overcrowding, budget cuts and a staffing crisis are all being raised as potential factors, none unique to Wandsworth. In the last year alone, the prison's inspector has issued three urgent notifications when there are serious concerns about conditions at Bristol, Woodhill and Exeter prisons. Safety in jail has deteriorated rapidly in the last 10 years. Rates of self-harm remain close to record levels. A quarter of deaths in prison custody were self-inflicted. Inexperienced staff and poor retention rates are also putting strain on the system, with prisoners often locked away for nearly 23 hours of the day. Rehabilitation almost impossible. And the picture in youth offender institutions is equally bleak. There have been six justice secretaries in five years, and though England and Wales still have the highest rate of incarceration in Western Europe, they have the highest reoffending rates too. Will this embarrassing and alarming escape finally see a new focus on the state of our prisons? Well, we did ask to speak to a government minister, but no one was available. Earlier, I spoke to Pia Sinha, former governor of several prisons and now CEO of the Prisons Reform Trust. I asked her first what Daniel Khalif's escape reveals about our prison system. I think it's incredibly worrying and I think that it's indicative of the state of the prison service right now. It's very sad that it's taken an escape of, of someone with very high profile to have brought this attention on. But I think people in my world have been banging on about the kind of risk to this for many months now. I mean, it's interesting you say that because it seems to me there are two schools of thought about this. One, that this is an audacious escape and he outsmarted the prison authorities. Or the other, and you seem to be in that camp, that this is indicative of a prison that can't even fulfil the basic function of keeping prisoners inside. Yes, I would agree with that. I think that, you know, the investigation that's been commissioned will highlight the facts and I think until then we, we, we are only speculating 
But given the conditions that prisons are under, and especially somewhere like Wandsworth, it's one of the largest jails in the country. It's probably in the top five overcrowded prisons. It's got a staffing crisis. So all of these things mean that the routines that prisons run by, prisons have to function on routine. And when you have overcrowded prisons, when you have staff retention issues, those routines that are the kind of backbone of any uh, well-run prison go by the wayside. And that's when risk starts to happen. I mean, we had the chief inspector of prisons in last night talking about yes. Wandsworth. It is rat infested. It is mouse infested. It is not, it, staff morale is so low, he was implying staff can't even be bothered sometimes to come into work. Yes. How would that impact the ability to keep prisoners safe, yes. but also on the inside yes. where you keep the public safe? So prisons operate, uh, generally operate on a staff-prisoner ratio. So if you've got a certain number of prisoners, in order to safely manage it, you need to have a safe level of staffing. It, it's just common sense. But if you have a high level of absenteeism, uh, if you have people off sick, if you have retention issues, that ratio then starts getting very disproportionate. And as a result of that, the regime that can be meaningfully delivered, the systems and processes that need to run become compromised. Uh, because it's just you just slow everything down in order to be able to do it safely or you cut corners. The focus is on the state of Wandsworth at the yes. moment because of this escape. But we know there have been three urgent notifications, which is essentially saying a pr prisons are in crisis at Correct. that moment. Correct. Do you get any sense that the government is listening? I think it's just backed itself into a very, very difficult position. And part of that is, is that you have opened the floodgates for prisoners entering into the system, either because of the court backlog or the barrister's strike or whatever the reasons are that we've been given about why so many prisoners are coming into custody in the first place. And it's created this bottleneck. And that is, is meaning that there's more people coming in and less people going out. You do the maths, it means that they're just overburdened. And then the perfect storm with that is, is that you've got a depleted staffing group. You're, you're not recruiting fast enough. So they have the pipelines open for staff coming in, but they're not being able to control the other end of the pipeline where they are draining out of the system. So they, it's, it's, a, it's a slightly powerless position for the government to be in. But what we need is some courage. We need some brave decisions to say, well, unless we stop that tide, unless we find ways of cutting the demand, we're not going to really fix I mean, the problem. when you talk about brave decisions, you're essentially talking about sending fewer people to prison. Correct. And, and, and politically, that is something this government doesn't it's look not keen invested. on at all. Correct. And, and you, you've got short sentences, people coming in and out and in and out of custody. They're damaging sentences. They do very little to rehabilitate prisoners. And they are, you know, they're very viable community alternatives that are not being used often enough. But for the public, that's a difficult message for many right. people, isn't it? I understand that, but we have to go back to the evidence in that case. And sometimes what you need to look at is what the underlying issues are that bring people or drift people into custody in the first place. And if you're addressing those, a lot of those are mental health issues, substance misuse issues. Uh, for women, particularly, it's, it's around their own histories of abuse. And we've got to try and address the root cause rather than sentence our way out of a problem. I mean, I just wonder, just this week, a court in Germany was refusing yes. to extradite someone because they're essentially arguing the UK prison system is unfair. I mean, that's damning, isn't it? It is, and you know, it's, it's embarrassing, I think, for our government to be, in a, to be presiding over a system where people are, you know, what are, what's the observation outside? The observation for people outside of UK looking in at our prison system with a catalogue of these, uh, uh, you know, errors that have happened, uh, it makes people have very little confidence in the system. And I don't envy our senior leaders who are trying to grapple with this, this problem, but unless there is political will to do something different, we will constantly be in crisis mode, I fear. Pierre Sinha, thanks very much for coming in. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Okay.